Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell with the Korea IT Times, and I'm here with Echo philosopher Derek Jensen, the author of Bright Green Lies and an attendee of the Colorado School of Mines who studied physics. How are you, Derek? Nice to see you again. Yeah, it's good to see you too. I, I, I make that intro specifically about physics and mining because a lot of your work points to the underlying structure that um, supports uh, civilization, urbanization, and of course our lives, um, much of which is uh, extractive and uh, requires a lot of uh, intensive, intensive uh, energy and so forth. So maybe we can get into some of that. I, I wanna run through, when I approached you about this, this interview, I wanted to run through some of the quotes that I've seen out there about um, renewable energy, green technology, green cities, you know, this kind of thing. And I hope maybe you can clear some of these uh, myths and uh, even lies up for us. That'd be great. Um, let me start with a um, famous uh, environmentalist author and uh, who's done quite a lot of good work. In a film, This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein says, I've been to more climate rallies than I can count. But the polar bears, she asked question, they still don't do it for me. I wish to tell them, but there's one thing I've learned. It's stopping climate change isn't really about the polar bears. It's about us humans. Uh, someone who's done a lot of good work and then makes this kind of statement, it shows some, some problems with reasoning. Can you, can you address this particular issue with, with humans? Well, I think, I think what it really shows is a, a problem in the environmental movement that there's been a transformation in the environmental movement where at one point it was about protecting wild places and wild beings. And it has been transformed into being more about sustaining this unsustainable culture for a little bit longer. And I mean, I can't see David Brower saying that protecting wild places is all about us. There was. There's, you know, and it, it, it's a little bit unfair for me to say that there's been this transformation in the environmental movement because this, this tension has been there for a long time. And it's really, you can see it 120 years ago, 130 years ago, uh, in the tension between John Muir and Gifford Pinchot. That John Muir was, was really about protecting wild places for their own sake. And Gifford Pinchot was about conserving resources to use to maintain and build civilization. And that for a time, uh, the, the protect wild places for their own sake was a little bit in the ascendancy in the environmental movement. And that has almost completely disappeared in the last 30 years. And the uh, the sort of global warming movement and what I call the bright green movement, which is sort of a technotopian perspective that technology will save civilization has, uh, has really uh, global warming and, and uh, technotopian ideals have really taken over a lot of environmentalism so that it would have been I mean, at one point, I mean, we go back to, at one point they actually passed something in the Endangered Species Act, which was about protecting endangered species for their own sake. It's not about protecting, um, specifically protecting, you know, desert pupfish or, or, or any other creatures for their commercial use. Instead, it was protecting them because it's the right thing to do. And I cannot imagine that sort of legislation being passed today. I can't even imagine most environmentalists pushing it anymore because, you know, we get, and, and I want to be really clear that, you know, Bill McKibben, for example, has, has uh, there is nobody in the world who has worked more tirelessly to raise awareness of global warming and selflessly to raise awareness of global warming, but he always says that he's doing it because he wants to save civilization. He doesn't say it because he wants to save little brown bats. He doesn't say it because he wants to protect coho salmon. He doesn't say it because he wants to protect mountain bluebirds. And he says he wants to protect, to protect civilization. 
And part of the problem with that, of course, is that civilization, this culture has been, is, is functionally dependent upon destroying the natural world. It's functionally dependent on using more than the natural world gives willingly. And, you know, if we want, if you want, we can go through just how incredibly fecund the planet was. There were, I mean, there's no, there's no penguins in the Northern hemisphere. You know why? Because they were all gotten rid of the ecological equivalent. They were called great ox and they were all the way down into Europe. And the last one was killed in the 19th century. And um, the great banks of cod were so large that they were, uh, they slowed ships down. Ships would be trying to go through the, the school of fish and they would not, uh, it would slow the ship down. Uh, whales, there were so many whales that it, it looked perpetually foggy off the coast of New England because of their breath. And they were a hazard to shipping. People were afraid there were so many whales, they were afraid their ship was going to run into a whale and it would damage their ship. You, you hear there's, there's stories like this again and again, and they're not, I mean, they are at this point, they seem almost unbelievable, but there were, there were flocks of passenger pigeons so large that they would darken the sky for days at a time, flying 60 miles an hour and sounding like rolling thunder. And there would be so many roosting in trees that the branches would break. And they would roost there for a while and then move to other trees. And it would look like it snowed because of all the bird poop. Um, so many Eskimo curlews. You close your eyes and shoot up in the air. And um, you might hit 10 birds, 15 birds. Um, just yesterday, uh, no, Sunday, so two days ago, a, um, a friend of mine was, was telling me about uh, being up in the Copper River in Alaska, where, I mean, the Copper River, where there are so many fish, so many salmon still, that uh, they, um, you don't use fishing line. You, you just put a net in the water and you scoop up a fish. And um, that was the case. Oh, I read a contemporary account of the Hudson River where the, the fish would be so thick that um, you couldn't put a net in the water because the fish would carry it away. And- <laughs> it take you with it. And that's um, well. Let me let me let me ask a question here. The point, then. the point is that that, mm -hmm. it, that this way of life has is based on destroying the natural world, and it can't last forever. And you know, I, I've said before that 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 all of my work can be summed up by the understanding that. This way of life won't last forever. And when it's done, I would prefer that there's more of the world left rather than less. And that's it. I don't want to keep this party going for another generation just so it's that much, the world is that much worse when it's done. Let me, uh, let, let me ask, uh, go two directions here. One is philosophically. The other one is uh, the technical part. So philosophically, what I see in your work, and tell me if I'm right, uh, is is there's a there's a fundamental intrinsic value to nature. If you, if people are religious, they say uh, sacredness of nature. If they're not, it's an intrinsic value. Whereas in other uh, ideologies, it's uh, nature is an objective thing to be conquered, uh, like uh, Francis Bacon, um, you know, so forth. So, can you address these two in this holistic project that you have or that you talk about? Yeah, um, and that's, you know, I, 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 a moment that saved my sanity was back in my 20s. I was in a library and a book jumped off the shelf at me and um, I opened it up and the book was The Natural Alien by Neil Everenden. And in that book, he's talking uh, he's, he's citing David Ehrenfeld, who wrote a great book called The Arrogance of Humanism. And in there, he, he talks about, so what do you do if you present some impassioned defense of some creature? And when you get done presenting this impassioned defense of why this creature should not be driven extinct, the person you're talking to says, well, what good is it? And he said, really, the only answer you can give is, well, what good are you? 
and not to insult them, but to point out the absurdity of that question. And then he goes into this analysis of if you break down the human body, uh, it would be worth, you know, your bones would be worth X amount for fertilizer. And, um, you know, you're, you could break down the energy inside your body. You could throw you in a fire and, you know, heat you up. If you, if you've got enough fat on you, uh, you could, you could eat the person and all this discussion presumes, I mean, all this, okay, I'm going to back up and say there's a, um, I was doing a talk at, I think it was Yale or Harvard. I think it was Yale. It was at Yale um, by Skype many years ago. And a bunch of the people in the audience were saying that the, uh, that putting dollar values on nature is the best way to save it. That if we do ecosystem services where we recognize that the, uh, that the, river, that the forest is worth this amount of money for cleaning up water and the river's worth this amount of money for the water that the clean water you can drink and, and the salmon are worth this amount of money for how much you can sell them. And I kept saying, no, you know, that the, the, the salmon have value for themselves. The, the forest has value for itself and the salmon have value to the forest and the forest has value to the salmon. And those values are not, um, monetarily definable necessarily. And they were disagreeing. And then finally I just stopped and I said, you know, actually you've convinced me you're right. And I think that the same thing is true with human beings and that human beings have specific financial value. And that is their sole value, we can put a financial value on somebody's life. And one of the, one of the students said, yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's what insurance companies do all the time, you know, with their actual, actual actuarial charts. And I said, yeah, it's so true. In fact, that um, I was talking to your parents before I came to do this, this, this talk. And we presumed that because you're at Yale, your future earnings are going to be about a million dollars. I'm sorry, about $4 million, which means the present value of all your future earnings is about a million. So um, we did just those back of the envelope calculations and there's good news and bad news. The good news is that I way overpaid because I paid your parents $5 million. And the bad news is I'm going to kill you now. And your parents were delighted with this deal because, because I way overpaid. And so my point is that all of this valuing through only financial value works great so long as you actually don't care about the... Uh, the dog is barking because bears are banging on the window downstairs. I figure bears had showed up. Yeah. Um, anyway, so this only works. Okay, my point is that we pretend. Okay, I'm going to back up again because there's this great line by a Canadian lumberman. It's when I see trees or when I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And here's the thing. If when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you're going to treat them one way. If when you look at trees, you'll treat them another way. If when you look at this particular tree, you see this particular tree, you'll treat it differently still. And so many indigenous people have said to me that the fundamental difference between Western and indigenous philosophies is that even the most open-minded Westerners generally perceive the world as consisting of resources to be exploited as opposed to other beings to enter into relationship with. And if you perceive the world as consisting of other beings centered in a relationship with, you're going to treat it differently than if you perceive it as consisting of resources. So in many ways, I think that the murder of the planet is happening because we're fundamentally misperceiving the world. We're fundamentally perceiving the world as we are the only ones who matter and nobody else matters at all, except insofar as how I can use them. And this is true, whether we're talking about um, non-humans, this is true, whether we're talking about humans of a different sex than we are, humans of a different race than we are, humans of a different culture than we are. It's um, this inability or unwillingness, this, this, this willingness to define others as meaningless is at the core of 
of what, why, and how we are killing the planet. The the intrinsic is something that you can't that we can't just say, right? So we can't say that student couldn't say that they're intrinsically valuable, but it's but they'll know it's obvious as with their parents. The same with uh, polar bears or other animals. Um, this particular split, I think there's something to it. And, and of course it needs to be worked out. And you mentioned Muir and uh, of course also there's uh, Leopold and uh, uh, Carson. And the, the type of environmentalism at that time or that came up at that time is totally different than today. Uh, today you'll see uh, we're climate activists, we're human rights people and so forth and so on. But there's, a, there's this, this particular split not so much with the money thing, but with um, going into human rights, going into climate activists and getting away from uh, this kind of a, a meat and potatoes or this muscle of the environmentalism is something you've also talked about and, and you think it's dangerous. And I agree, uh, you know, comparing some of the bright green that you call it today to the mirrors and the uh, Leopolds. Can you just say a little bit about that? And then I'm going to talk about the dams and the um, technology. So I understood most of what you said, but I'm not sure what your question is. The question is, is what, what is this disconnect going back that, that come? Okay. So you have the, the strong, the muscle environmentalism of, you know, that goes back to Muir and Aldo Leopold, Rachel Carson. But today you talk about bright green. There's a kind of rhetoric that's coming up. There's a kind of green varnish that's being put on a new system that, yeah. You, so I'm going in that direction. Part of the, part of the problem is that, I mean, it's all pretty simple. If, if your loyalty is to the natural world, that's one of the things that's really been transformed in the environmental movement over the past couple generations is that at one point their loyalty was to the natural world. And there are a lot of environmentalists now who their loyalty has never been to the natural world. It's been to this way of life. And that's, so I used to get very upset at, uh, some, especially American Buddhists who would get back, get, they would get angry at me, some American Buddhists, not all, but some American Buddhists would get very angry at me because they would tell me that I needed to learn the notion of non-attachment because I care about the salmon. And they said, you need to learn to not be attached to the salmon's continued existence. And that is a fundamental that is not what we need to not be attached to. What we need to not be attached to is car culture or computers. <laughs> and sure, I'll use a computer and sure I drive a car, but I need to not be attached. That's what we really not need to not be attached to. And yes, ultimately I need to not be attached to my own life because I'm gonna die. But there's a difference, a fundamental difference. And it's a fundamental thought error to compare the death of an individual to the extirpation of a species. Because we are supposed to die. I mean, that's, you know, I hate to break it to you, but you're gonna die someday and so am I. And, oh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> and that's the, that is the fundamental rule of, of life. Yep. And, um, and this, is, this is one reason that Every spiritual tradition is really based, the central metaphor of every spiritual tradition is death and rebirth because, you know, it's the old, the old uh, English folk song, John Barleycorn must die. And that's, you know, the seed has to be buried so that the, the new plant can grow. And then ultimately, you know, a rat is going to eat the, the plant and then a uh, falcon is going to eat the rat and then uh, the falcon's going to die of a disease and then will be eaten by the worms. I mean, this is just, this is really basic stuff. That's how it's supposed to go. But, but species being driven extinct the way they are is 
is like a mass murderer coming in and just wiping out your entire family. There's, there's a fundamental difference between, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go a different direction for a second. Cause I just think this, I just love this, this metaphor, this image. I read a book several years ago um, by Charles Frazier called 13 Moons. And it's a, it's, a, it's a love story between a man and a woman, which is kind of interesting. But what I really loved, and the reason that I, I, I loved the book was because the primary love story, so far as I'm concerned, is between the protagonist and the land where he lives. And it's set in North Carolina from 1820 to 1900. And at the start, the, um, there are still a lot of wolves. The buffalo have just been driven out. And by the end of the book, he's living next to a railroad track and the whole area is developed. And he has this beautiful soliloquy near the end as he's an old, old man. And most of his friends have died. Everybody he knew has died. And he says, you know, that's just natural. But as you grow older, the generation above you dies and your friends start dying. That's just, we evolved with this. But what we didn't evolve is to have the entire land base die. And what was supposed to be commonality, you know, the, the, the Talawa Indians lived where I live now, and they still live here, but they lived here for 12,500 years, and they were living pretty sustainably. And the salmon could be counted on every year. So yes, your mother's going to, your grandmother's going to die, your father's going to die, your older brother's going to die, your friends are going to die. But what is always there are the redwood trees and the salmon and the sea lions and the elk. They're always there. And yes, individual trees, but the forest itself remains. And there is no place for us to comprehend that level of grief and that level of dis, dispossession. And anyway, now back to back to, to the modern environmentalists is that. One of the things that's happened as well is that one of the things that any abusive system has to do is to make us dependent upon the abuser. This is classic in an individual abuse situation. That's why the abuser will often make the abuse victim financially dependent upon them and then also destroy their social, con social contacts so that they're dependent for them and they can't escape as easily. But the same thing is true on a large scale. That the apartheid were written primarily, they weren't written out of explicit racism and hate, and those words are in quotes because of course it was racism and hate, but they weren't written explicitly for that reason. What they were written explicitly for is to get workers for mines because the local people worked, they lived in subsistence community um, with their own cattle, with their own farming, and they didn't have a cash economy. So among the first laws of apartheid, were those that put in poll taxes, hut taxes, dog taxes to make them get cash. So how are they gonna get cash? Somebody has to get a job. And there was in the 1830s, there was a, a conversation written letters between a, a Southern American, Southern United States pro-slavery philosopher and his Northern abolitionist capitalist buddy. And he said, the, the pro-slavery guy, said, you know, we would get rid of our slaves in a heartbeat if we had the right conditions. And the right conditions are, he's basically, he said, there are certain land conditions, land ownership conditions in which in, it's in the capitalist best interest to own slaves or not own slaves. And this is all gonna have a point in a minute. And mm -hmm. in the capitalist best interest to own slaves when you have a lot of land and not many people, because if you have a lot of land and not many people, it means that people have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency, which means they're not going to go to work for you. If, on the other hand, you have a lot of people, like in a city, and they not a lot of land, that means people don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means they have to go to work for you, which means your return on investment is actually much greater than it would be if you actually own them. Because when you own them, you have to pay for them when they're little, you gotta pay for them when they're old. You still have to take care of them all the time. But if they are uh, 
if there's a ton of people and not much land, all you have to do is pay them a pittance. And, and so here's the point. If they become dependent, not on the land, but on the system. And then we'll take this another step because if your experience is that your water comes from a river and your food comes from a land, you will defend to the death that river and that land because your life depends on it. Not if your philosophy, if your experience, if your experience on the hand is that your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from the tap, you will defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. And so what's happened is that a lot of environmentalists, it's not that they're stupid and it's not that they hate nature. It's that they, like so many of us, have forgotten that ultimately all water comes from the earth and all food comes from the earth. And they think that it's the system that brings them to us. And so their loyalty has been transferred to the system instead of to the land. And, you know, Daniel Quinn put this much more succinctly back in the 90s when he said that we have created a system in which we are dependent for our very lives on a system that is killing the planet. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to first recognize that and we have to recognize that we have painted ourselves into a corner and it's a very, very, very bad idea to continue to paint ourselves into a worse and worse corner just to keep this party going a little bit longer. You know, I don't know if, if you read um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? Galaxy? The Galaxy. Galaxy. Douglas Hitchhiker's Adams. Guide. Yeah, back in the 80s and 90s. But the, he had a metaphor that was just so obvious that and it was brilliant the way he did it, that he had this group of, of people, these group of barbarians or something, basically going around partying and destroying everything they touch but they don't care because they just want to keep the party going. And, right. um, and that's us, you know? That, that reminds me is when the, when the plague was coming up over Europe, it wasn't, uh, well, let's try to do something about it. Doing something about it was just partying until, you know, they just got the plague. Right. Yeah. yeah. And well, that may be, uh, excusable when when all there when all that is at stake is your own life that is right. not usable when we're talking about life on the planet right i mean honestly if i had i mean if, if somehow i magically knew that i have 24 hours to live you know i probably wouldn't do any hard work you know, I, I don't know what I would, <laughs> I would probably worry, but if we could, if we could get rid of the worry, you know, I would hope that I would spend the last 24 hours, you know, maybe party or do something crazy, doing something fun. But yeah. the point is that, um, that's not what I would do if there was even the slightest chance of protecting those I love. Mm -hmm. That's right. The, this, uh, yeah, I wasn't going in a, in a direction towards technology, but I've gotten interested in this particular slant that you put on the uh, the idea of land and the land ethic. I, I hear it in what you're talking about, this land ethic, and this goes way back, but principally like out of Leopold and so forth. It, in, in the case of slavery, also, when you talk about people needing support, you know, we have to have a support system, right? Because if you move people off the land, where are they going to go? And um, where do I want to go with this? I think that um, the, the land is the fundamental basis for life and on the earth, as far as things go. Uh, and then there's all kinds of forces going on. You know, there's geophysical forces with the winds and the atmosphere and all of that. When we put a system in that is say over the last 250 years, particularly 
that is that is so powerful in the sense of there's these localized centers called cities. There's the technology of the ships moving around. There's agriculture and all of that. This is what's putting the stress on the planet. And the the from a perspective of a land ethic, how this may be too difficult of a question to even to ask anybody, but I'm going to ask you, what would we do to bring that front and center and try to move away from, you know, say these massive ships and the, you know, the big agriculture? I mean, I mean, this is a big question. I mean, I mean, we could break it down too. Where, where do you think we could jump in there and, and try to, you know, do something with that particular milieu? Well, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, I think for me, I always fall back on something a doctor friend of mine says that um, correct diagnosis or proper diagnosis, accurate diagnosis is the first step toward correct treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that needs to happen is we need to recognize that this culture from the beginning has been based on taking more from nature than nature can give. And, you know, I, I've been saying for decades that when we think of Iraq as the first thing we think of cedar forest so thick, the sunlight never touched the ground and no. And those, those forests were cut down. That's the first written myth of Western civilization of Gilgamesh deforesting the hills and valleys to make a great city. And that's, that's when what's happening. And the, the Arabian Peninsula was, was um, oak savanna, and those were all cut down. And the Near East was heavily forested. Greece was heavily forested. Ancient Greek philosophers were complaining about deforestation and mm -hmm. how it was harming water quality. And it's the same. Uh, we, in Bright Green Lives, we quote, um, I don't remember who it was, uh, but it was this ancient Chinese uh, philosopher asking why the mountains are bald and then giving the answer they're bald because they're right next to a city. And I mean, that, that this is not, nothing I'm saying is new. This is, people have been observing this for literally thousands of years. That's one of the jokes I like to make is I'm going to lay out a pattern and let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years, uh, which is <laughs> deforestation, which, which, has been a line that, that I like that I sort of stole from somebody, which is um, forests precede us and deserts dog our heels. And so I think we should recognize that pattern and we should also recognize, I remember when I was a baby environmentalist 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago now, um, having dinner with my friend and environmental mentor, John Osborne, and I remember him writing on a, on a napkin as we're, as we're at the restaurant, uh, making a little circle and saying, here's a city, and then a bigger circle and saying, the city requires inputs from this area. And as the city grows, it requires them from an ever larger area. And so as, the, I mean, that's the history of civilization in a couple sentences. That's the history of empire. That's why they have empires. Um, I mean, that's, that's all this is really about is if you have, you know, New York City, where does their, where do the bricks come from? Where does the wood come from? Where does the food come from? And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about, um, you know, grains or coconuts or pork rinds, you know, it doesn't matter. Where does it come from? It came from somewhere. And then where does all the waste go? Where does the, the poop go? In the case of New York City, it used to be dumped in the ocean and now it is um, shipped off to, I believe, Alabama. And we can ask this for every city in the world. Um, and in Bright Green Lies, we do calculations for, we, well, we use somebody else's calculations um, who had, had done them really great on basically if you, for the city of Portland, if everybody was doing intensive, very intensive use of their land 
um, they would, I think they'd be able to support a population of like one fifth of Portland. That's if every single person was, you know, putting in fruit trees, having a little fish pond and growing stuff on their roof and growing stuff in their backyard. Um, all of that food has to come from somewhere. And I love James Howard Kunstler's line about how we need to be reality-based adults. And it's the same with all this bright green stuff. You know, we hear about how great wind and solar are. It's like, you know, windmills don't grow on the windmill tree and <laughs> solar harvesting facilities don't appear out of nowhere. I mean, this is, we have this, this idea. It's like in this culture, every day is supposed to be Christmas and Santa Claus is supposed to keep bringing us free energy and free wood. Well, I got bad news, which is that wood was somebody's home. You know, somebody lived in the forest that was cut down to, to provide that. And at one point, we could always pretend that there was yet another frontier. We could always pretend that there was going to be one more hill over which we could, we could log next when we finish this one. Well, we live on a bounded sphere. And there is no such thing as infinite growth on a finite planet. You know, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but I became an environmentalist really in second grade because I already loved nature and I loved, you know, the grasshoppers and the meadow larks. And then they put in a subdivision right next to where I lived. And between first and second grade, all the meadows and pastures were converted into white box houses. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm, I'm like seven years old, so I didn't have infinite growth, finite planet, no, any of that. But what I do remember thinking is where, if they keep going, where will the meadow marks go? Where will the grasshoppers go? They can't keep doing this forever. I remember thinking that and I was seven years old. I mean, none of this stuff is cognitively challenging. It's only cognitively challenging because we are attempting to we're attempting to solve for something that's fundamentally insoluble, which is we want this way of life without destroying the planet. And it can't be done. I mean, I mean, what is it? I, I don't remember the numbers on this, so I'm making them up. Don't quote me exactly on the numbers, but basically it's like, what is it? The, the weight of humans, livestock, and pets is like, I don't know, 10 times or 50 times or something, the weight of, of the, the land, all non-human land mammals. It's just, I mean, it's, 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 it's absolutely insane. At what point people say, okay. you know, gosh, Derek, you need to I wish you would compromise. Like, sure. I'll compromise. Let's make it. So it's only, you know, 50, 50 years. How about <laughs> nine to one, their favorite, but it was, 5,000 years ago. Right. There's so many cows. There's so many cows on the planet. That's the, that's a problem. Uh, maybe we could, uh, you could probably let those be free. That would be good for grasslands, but uh, prevent them from having a lot of children and then uh, our baby cows. And then we, you know, eventually those would, those herds would decrease. You would have to kill them off or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, these are, these are nice thoughts. But, but again, yeah, when you have that kind of biomass, it's going to be producing a lot of, yeah. And the problem is that we value, and again, I mean, this comes back to, the, to your first question. We value more this way of life than we do life on the planet. And that's the problem. And we value, somebody said to me, I don't know if this is true, but uh, I heard Wes Jackson was the one who said this. Wes Jackson said, this is God back in the nineties. He said that he thought that Walmart was the only thing keeping the United States from having a revolution. And that's because <laughs> really? uh, you could buy like, cheap diapers and cheap plastic crap. Uh -huh. And that's true in that. Okay. Here's a great example is, you know, they're, they're, they have legalized marijuana in much of the United States. And for a time it was illegal 
And then after that, it was legal, except it was legal for medical marijuana. And in California, you could, uh, it was determined by the county how many plants you could have. And the county where I live said you can have up to 99. And uh, the county commissioners or the county supervisors were going to reduce that number from 99 to six. And I went to the supervisors meeting that night and it was packed. And it was just a beautiful example of participatory democracy in action because had the supervisors reduced it from 99 down to six, they would have been strung up. I mean, this is, that's how, I mean, that's how the American revolution happened is that the British crown would try to put in some law and the crown courts would try to enforce it. And all the, all the U.S. patriots would say, nah, not going to happen. We don't like it. And so they, they were going to reduce it 99 to six. And the people, the people, the people spoke and they said, no. So that's, that's interesting. It's kind of, it was fascinating to watch participatory democracy in action. The problem is that anytime there is something having to do with salmon, there's going to be four people show up and it's the same four people. Mm-hmm. My point is, I wish that people love the salmon the way they love their marijuana. Mm-hmm. And I wish that, I mean, the point here is not marijuana. The people is, if they're going to screw over Western Lily, nobody cares. It's going to be four people. And if they're going to screw over coho salmon, four people. Screw over Pacific lampreys, four people. Take away our marijuana, not going to happen, buddy. You want to take away my crap at Walmart? Not going to happen, buddy. We're going to have a revolution. That's, That's my so point. Cool. Value Good. that. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Think what would happen. Oh. Oh, oh, there was this poll in the UK. They asked young people if, which was more important to them, access to Wi-Fi or access to sunlight? And you know which they said, right? I access get the idea. More important. But uh, have, you seen, have you seen some young people are actually doing this metaverse thing where they put the the uh, VR headset on for like a week or I don't know how long, to a month or something. I mean, it's getting a bit kind of crazy. Yeah. Well, the whole thing is crazy. And it's where, it's where we've been headed. Again, when you value, when you value, okay, it goes, it, this all goes deeper too. In my book, Myth of Human Supremacy, I talk mm-hmm. about some of the greatest artist creations in the world. And I talk about, the Sistine Chapel, Mona Lisa, you know, and, you know, I'm being ethnocentric for this just because I don't know them of other cultures, but we could talk about Taj Mahal, you know, we could talk about these great creations, but you know what they all have in common? They're all made by humans. That's what we value. And in fact, logicians and philosophers will say explicitly that things created by non-humans, things created by nature they don't count. Why does it not? Why does frog song not count as art? Why does bird song not count as art? Why does sex not count as art? You know, greatest inventions of all time: uh, the wheel, the lever, the uh, the the water pump, the uh, the screw, the gunpowder. You know, the, we 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 come up with all those textiles. Those are the greatest inventions. I'm sorry. What about sex? What about what about vision? What about metabolism? What about proprioception? That's how you tell, like when my hand is behind my head, I still know where it is. That's because of proprioception. You, you, you couldn't walk without proprioception. What about- um, let, me, let me stop on that one. When we were children, we would draw like letters on each other's backs. And we were really fascinated that we could tell what the letter was by drawing each other's back. And there's really yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating things that we find out about Yes. Yeah, and, and, and my point is that this is just an example of us valuing what we create and not valuing what nature creates. That we don't consider the colors of trees in the fall to be a form of art. We don't consider sunset to be art. We consider, I mean, the, the arrogance is just absolutely extraordinary. And it's what leads to this virtual reality. This is why this is why scientists get so excited. Oh, I saw this thing a few years ago. This maybe ten years ago now. This astronomer, somebody asked him why we need to explore Mars, 
And he said to answer that most important question of all, which is, are we all alone? And I thought, are you crazy? I mean, how can you ask if we're all alone when we are surrounded by all of these other beings? You know, if they found, if they found a rabbit on Mars, this would be the most amazing thing in the world. But what do they do here? They put, they put, they, they test makeup on them. You know, it's like here, it's no big deal. And they get so excited when they create some sort of enzyme that now they've created life in a laboratory. It's like, dude, rabbits create life every day. Females do it everywhere. And bacteria does it everywhere. And insects do it everywhere. It's like, but that doesn't count. Why? Because it didn't come from our brains. Well, tree, trees are great nano printers for mangoes. Oh, that's great. That's great. I love it. Great, right? But yeah, I mean, this, this is interesting. And going in the direction of your uh, human supremacy book, I think that that's kind of getting at the root of this uh, initial question I asked, right? Because, and also what's happening to the environmental movement, because if we, we have this kind of human rights thing and, and you can't question that. Well, yes, you can if you're destroying the natural environment by focusing on just this one area and then you beat right. people over the head with this particular thing, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, and I have no problem at all, obviously, with people advocating for human rights. Right, That's a right. great thing. The problem is when there are so many advocates for human rights who have utter contempt for non-humans and who, uh, um, deride uh, any concern for non-humans as um, it's just it's just it's extraordinary to me that that and 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 again I don't have a problem with a human rights organization advocating for human rights. And I don't have a problem with an environmental movement advocating for human rights. I do have a problem with an environmental movement that no longer advocates for the environment. Yeah. And with an environmental movement that says explicitly, they had a Greenpeace, a former head of Greenpeace um, who did not have a background in environmentalism. He had a background in, in human rights. He said, we don't need to worry about the world. The world will be fine. Can you right. imagine? Can you imagine? And this guy, this guy sort of made his bones fighting against apartheid. And can you imagine the outcry had he said, we don't need to worry about black South Africans. They'll be fine. They'll continue. They won't all be killed. But that's his attitude about the about and the day the actually, day, Derek, the actually this uh, Winston Churchill said this about Indians when they were dying by the tens of millions from famine. They breed like rabbits. I mean. If we were to, I mean, this kind of thinking is, you know, yeah. It's, it's fundamentally colonialist in terms of, and it's, well, actually it's fundamentally supremacist that right. it basically is, I don't care, you know, if we're talking about Winston Churchill, I don't care about the Indians dying. And if we talk about the former head of Greenpeace, it's like, I don't care about the fish dying. I don't care about the birds dying. They'll be fine. Right. That's not how it would work if it's your family, you know, right. Right. you cared. I mean, that's what people, people will say to me, gosh, Derek, you know, the world's going to be fine. Don't worry about the world. I always say, you know, when people say this, when I'm doing a talk, um, I've done this before where they say, somebody in the audience says, you know, the world's going to be absolutely fine. We're just transforming it. We're not actually killing it. I stop <laughs> my talk and I say, okay, great. Um, does anybody here have a pocket knife I can borrow? And then somebody will hand me their pocket knife and I'll walk out in the audience and I'll say to the person who said the world, the worst, the world's going to be fine. And I'll open the pocket knife and I'll say, "Give me your hand." I'm like, I'm not going to give you my hand. I said, "Come on, give me your hand." And finally, they give me their hand, and I say, "Okay, I'm not really going to cut you, so don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you." But this is the attitude: like, I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to transform. I'm going to cut off your finger, and then another finger, and then another finger, and then I'm going to cut off your toes, and then I'm going to flay you. And even when your heart stops beating, you're not going to be dead. Because you'll just be transformed because 90% of the cells in your body don't even have your DNA. They're just bacteria. And they're going to be fine. 
the bacteria is just going to be completely fine. I don't know what you're worried about. And of course, I'm not going to hurt anybody and I don't hurt anybody. But right. the point is, it's, a, it's an exercise. That's a reductionist macabre, right? You're, you're, you're playing on this particular kind well, of reductionist what I'm, trying macabre. Bring, I'm trying to bring it home. Yeah. Or I, another one that I'll do is they'll say, the world's going to be fine. I'll say, great. So let's pretend that you and your family are in your house and a mass murderer breaks into your house and they're torturing and killing all the members of your family. And you say, save me, save me, protect me. And I say, you know what? You got some cousins in Cincinnati. Your family's going to be fine. You know, your cousins will be fine. What's, I don't know what your big deal is. Right now, there are atrocities. Right now, coho salmon need our help. Right whales need our help. Pacific lampreys need our help. Um, it's probably too late for the Baiji. They needed our help, but we didn't give it. And what, you know, it's just, and, or, or somebody said to me at a talk one time, they said, how long do you think we have? And I said, pretend that right now you are being tortured in a shed. And I said to this person over and sitting next to you, how long do you think she has? How long can we wait before we do something? It's like, there are 200 species went extinct today. And those are my brothers and my sisters. Those are my kin. And they're your kin too. And we, I think the most important thing we need to do, and this is the fundamental failure. Yeah, we can talk about the thought errors of the bright green movement where they, they pretend not to understand that um, the, the uh, windmills require rare earths mining. And now there are big plans afoot to mine the bottom of the ocean. And they require lithium mines and they require you know, the destruction of Bao Tu in, with, with the rare earth mining there. They require all sorts of destruction. They can pretend that that's not the case. And those are thought errors, but it's still, that's not even the primary problem. The primary problem, and the primary problem is not valuing humans over non-humans. And the primary problem is not valuing human rights over elephant rights. The primary problem is valuing the global economy and the industrial economy over life on earth and frankly over human rights too because people will talk it just kills me when these human rights activists will talk about human rights when it comes to stopping the killing of elephants or stopping the killing of pangolins but i'm sorry where are they when it comes to the millions of human beings displaced by dams where are they when it comes to the people, forget the Mekong catfish, which was the largest, one of the largest migrations on the planet. Forget them. I, mean, I don't want to forget them. Yeah, they're huge. They migrate. And it was a larger migration than Buffalo migration and the migration on this by, by mass. And forget them, even though I don't want to. What about all the humans whose lives depend on the Mekong catfish? And what about the humans whose lives depend on those river systems, those river communities, not systems? What about all of them? Suddenly they're silent on that. And suddenly they're silent on um, the slave labor that goes into the, the solar panels. And I, do, I don't. So the point is, the point is, this is not even a question of human rights. It's a question of valuing the industrial civilization valuing machines, valuing machines over life on the planet. That's really what it comes down to. You know, let me, let me interject here because one thing that's interesting is I hear you talk and I, and I saw a recent article in the Financial Times. I don't see in the environmental movement, many people, and I, again, I, I don't want to say a big general thing here. How should I say this? Um, there's, a, there's a big focus on renewables right now in the mainstream media and so forth. I think that's a, that's a fair generalization. However, one thing that we don't hear a lot of people talking about, but the capitalist press has it. The Financial Times reported just, I think it was just like uh, last week, fossil fuels are at the whole time high for use. They're going up. Everything's going up. Can you, can you talk about this one? Oh, sure. This is, this is a really important thing that we talked about in Bright Green Lies, which was something called Jevons Paradox. Yep. And this, 
even if everything else made sense with the uh, wind energy, the solar, even if they, even if they were environmentally free, which they're not, this is what puts the lie to the whole movement is that Jevons was this guy, 19th century economist who studied coal use. And he, one of, his, one of the questions he asked is what happens to demand for coal when you come up with ways to use coal more, coal more efficiently? So you find a way you find, you find a way to make a new sort of oven that uses half as much coal to, to produce as much work. Um, you would think that coal use would go down because now you can use half as much coal to either cook dinner or if you're a capitalist to run the furnaces that make the buggies or whatever, you know, whatever it is you're going to do with them. So, but that's not what happened at all. What happened was that Increased efficiency in coal use led to increased demand for coal use. Because if you are able to use it more efficiently, you lower the per unit cost and you find more ways to use it. And so, and, and then this makes perfect sense. Pretend that you are, Give me some type of give me some type of job. I don't care or some type of business. I don't care what you're making something. Well, let's say let's say we're making I don't know plastic bottles. For okay, water. so you're making plastic bottles for water, and um, let's say it costs you. Let's say you sell the plastic bottles, not with the water in. Them, you sell the plastic bottles for ten cents a piece, and say they cost you five cents a piece to make. And then you're able to drop the price. So you get a cheaper, you get a more efficient way to use the plastic. So you drop your, your cost. All of a sudden, you can increase. Okay, your labor costs stay the same. Your, all the other costs stay the same. But your cost of plastic goes way down. All of a sudden, you can make a lot more stuff. So you have a choice. You can either put the money in your pocket, which you might do, or you can expand your business. And, um, you know, I mentioned marijuana earlier. And for indoor marijuana grows, one of your major costs is electricity. So let's say that your electricity costs are cut in half. Then all of a sudden, you can either keep the extra money or you can double the size of your grow for the same price. So you make twice as much money. And now all of a sudden, you're also using more plastic for your pots, using more soil, using more fertilizer, using more of everything else. And what they have found is that basically for, well, two things. One is every time a new source of energy has come online, it has not uh, replaced the old energy. It's added on top. The replacement is literally like one tenth. So, First, from, for many, many years, for, for thousands of years, basically there was human and non-human slavery was the main thing. And then, and then wood, wood for, by just burn wood. And then they brought coal on. Wood use did not decrease. It actually increased. Then they got coal. Next thing that comes online is oil. Sure. And coal use did not decrease. It increased. And then came, I don't know, hydro. And coal and oil did not decrease. And then came nuclear. Coal, oil, and hydro did not decrease. They just increased every single time. And that's true with wind, solar. It doesn't decrease oil and coal at all. The only thing that has increased oil and coal use at all has been recessions. A virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the other... Uh, thing to say about this is it's not true just for energy, but there was a study that we cite in the book where he did this for like 150 different, not Jevons, somebody else, somebody recently did this for like 150 different, different materials. And he found that that's true for all materials, that if you find a way to decrease your cost of nickel or gold or polyester, it doesn't matter what, corn, what you do is you find more uses for it and the, the, the actual use increases. It never goes down. 
Right. I mean, take let's take for let's take uh, let me give a hypothetical situation and we'll go to reality. There's this metal that we use, and we create this fascinating system for recycling this metal. Amazing. We get uh, maybe 90 something percent recycling on this metal. What happens? We use more. This metal is called aluminum, right? So you and um, uh, Lier and Max talk about this. We have uh, recycling of, uh, say, aluminum. Steel is recycled, a lot of it, uh, but we use more and more. Uh, you can't build new airplanes with uh, recycled metal and so forth. So this thing about using more and more, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, the, 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 one of the metals that is the most easily recyclable is copper. And I don't remember the numbers from the book, but like aluminum has some problems, like you said, and steel has some problems too, because the iron and steel is mixed with alloys and it can be incredibly energy complex and uh, not 100% efficient to take the alloys out. Um, one of the best metals for recycling is copper. And um, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I'm pretty sure that even with like even 90% copper recycling, that only accounts for something like 30% or 40% of the total copper used because the demand is so high. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, this is, it's just, it's absurd to say that recycling apart from the fact that metals recycling is one of the dirtiest industries on the planet, apart from all that, it's, it's just absurd to say, as long as you have a, an expanding economy, you're, you're, you're going to require more mines. And, and the, the, the solution that defenders of the system put forward is always, well, people don't wanna stop driving and that's true. People don't want to stop having all their metal stuff. But that doesn't alter the fact that physical reality always trumps what we want. Right. And right. we are killing the planet. And people 100 years from now are going to ask what was wrong with us that we didn't fight like hell when the world was going down. And they're going to ask, you know, people 100 years from now, 150 years from now are not going to go, oh gosh, those people faced really difficult choices because they had to choose between having televisions and a living planet. That's not what they're going to ask. They're going to go, I can't believe those people let the planet go down. I, years ago, years ago, yeah. I was, yeah. I was at a, um, God, this is like 1992 or something. I was at a, uh, a, a debate in quotes between two people running for the department of natural resources head in the state of Washington. And my question was, um, pretend that we are children 150 years from now and convince us not to hate you. And neither one answered. I might do what? that with my students. I might do that with my students sometime. That's a good exercise. Well, <laughs> it made me pretty hated in the moment. Everybody in the room just sort of despised me. And um, I think it, it, it is, that is one of the reasons that I write. You know, I think all the time about, or I think quite often about the resistance to Hitler in World War II. And um, they were trying to get rid of Hitler for many, many years. And then with D-Day, there was the recognition that the war is basically over. And um, they asked each other, do we want to continue to risk our lives in order to stop this war when it's clear Hitler's going to lose anyway? And so why don't we just take it easy, cruise on into the end? And, oh God, I always have a hard time. Henning von Treskow, I'm so glad I remember his name. And Henning von Treskow was a member of the resistance. And he said, no we have to continue for two reasons. One of them is that there are, I think it was 10,000 civilians being killed every day. So every day sooner that we stop the war is 10,000 civilians who've not been killed. That's just, that's excluding soldiers, you know, civilians. And then he said, also, we need to let the world know and we need to let history know 
that there were some of us who cared and there were some of us who were willing to do whatever we could to show that we don't agree with this. I think about this all the time when I do my writing. It's like, I don't write to be approved of by, it's nice when I get notes from people saying, hey, I love your work, but I don't so much write for the approval of most humans now. I write for the approval of the Coho Salmon, and I also write for the approval of the humans who live 150 years from now, presuming there's any left. I, I want for them to understand that there were a few of us who fought. 